Yep. So we are live now. Uh, let me see. Just YouTube, to, just to make sure everything is perfect. So I'm just checking the channel now, just to make sure our stream is working. Okay, yeah, we have a couple of audience there. Okay, coming back. So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, like wherever you joined from. So I am I joined from uh, USA, and it's uh, six thirty-three in the morning. And uh, Ben joined from Australia. I think it's uh, eleven o'clock there, right? Uh, it's about eight thirty. So eight thirty night. Okay, yeah, it's not too bad. And. Uh, mm -hmm. And money joined from uh, India. I think it's uh, almost like four or five p.m. And we have uh, one more, uh, one more uh, speaker. Uh, I think he's having some issues. Let me see. So he will join uh, in a couple minutes. And uh, before we get started, I would like to thank everyone for uh, uh, taking your time and uh, joining today's uh, event. And uh, this event is happening like every month over online uh, to connect Angular developers, uh, not just Angular, like anyone who wants to learn Angular or JavaScript uh, from any part of the world. And uh, it was started like uh, last month, uh, April, and we had an issue and Guggen uh, were talking about interesting uh, topics in the last uh, event. And today we have uh, like three talks from amazing uh, speakers. And I will just go through that. And uh, I would also like to uh, inform you that we have this event scheduled every month. So feel free to share this event with your uh, colleagues or friends. And uh, just in case, if you want to talk on this event about Angular or anything specific to uh, JavaScript, uh, please ping me. Please ping me in uh, on Twitter at uh, Ask Uday handle. And uh, you can also reach out to me in uh, meetup messages, or I will share my email at the end of this event. So you can just email me as well. So I'm going to be the host for this, ses uh, for this session. And I'm, I'm hosting this Angular meetup uh, in uh, Raleigh as well, which is a city in uh, like Southeast uh, US. And also, I'm hosting this Angular online meetup as well. right? And I, I also talk on uh, some Angular topics uh, then and there. So that's a quick introduction about me. So just a moment. Let me quickly check with the speaker. He's yet to join. Uh, I think he's having some technical difficulties. He's joining from Ukraine. OK, perfect. So let me go through the schedule for today, and then we can get started with our session today. So let me share my desktop. Okay, hope you are able to see my desktop. So, uh, yeah, welcome once again for uh, Angular Online Meetup. And today we have uh, three uh, amazing speakers. Uh, ben from Australia he is going to talk about uh, some token stuff. And uh, Alexander from Ukraine, he'll be talking about uh, RxJS. And uh, Maniraj from India is going to talk about uh, JavaScript. And this is a schedule I have. I'm not going to take much time. So I will uh, wrap it up uh, quickly within two hours. Uh, so we will start with welcome. That's what we are doing now. And uh, from 4.05 to 4.35, so all this time goes in uh, Indian Standard Time, IST. A token walks into a spa, so he's going to give a talk on uh, token. And if you have any question, just post it. Uh, ben will talk. Ben will answer your questions in the later part of ten minutes. 
and uh, from 445 to 520 we will go through rxjs unit testing from uh, alexander he is going to talk about how we can test uh, unit test rxjs and he is also the video author uh, in uh, udemy he has a course on rxjs there and from 530 to 550 uh, money is going to talk about uh, javascript basics so he will revisit all the basics that we need to know in uh, angular world right and in the end we will give a, a closing notes of this event and we will say a goodbye okay so that's what i have uh, for today for this two hours uh, session so just uh, uh, i mean take your time uh, post the question if you have any issues like uh, technical issues or something else just ping me on twitter or even you can uh, uh, chat me on uh, meetup messages okay so that's all uh, i have uh, over to you, Ben. Thanks very much. Do I have to open my screen up? Yep. That's me, you do. I just added it. Yep. There we go. Awesome. So thanks for having me. It is uh, 8.30 at night in Australia. Uh, I was very grateful. Um, that this meetup was, I think it was supposed to run a, a couple of hours later originally, wasn't it? Um, but I'm very grateful for it being brought back slightly so I'm not up at midnight. It's, uh, at time zones are fun, especially at this time where we can, uh, there's a lot more things that are happening online. But like I say, I'm very grateful to be able to speak to you all. Uh, my talk today is on uh, single page apps. It's not Angular specific, uh, whichever front end framework tools you're using for your single page apps, uh, this will be relevant to you. A bit about me first. My name is Ben Deckeray. Uh, I had a little bit of a technical issue earlier today in that uh, my slides are on slides.com and I can't edit them. For some reason, the slides.com editor is down at the moment. Uh, so my job title is actually a developer uh, advocate now, not a technical evangelist. I think people found that I was a bit too American. Uh, so we've we've softened that a bit now. I'm a developer advocate for Auth0. Uh, Auth0, if you haven't heard of us, we're like an identity and a cloud solution. Uh, it's like a if you use Stripe for payments, you'd use uh, Auth0 for authentication, login, password resets, all of those kind of things, single sign-on. Uh, the talk today talks a little bit about uh, authentication and tokenism, tokenization, which is a heavy part of the technology that Auth0 uses. But the the technologies itself, you don't need to use Auth0 to be able to, to put into practice what I'm talking to you about today. So essentially what I want to go through today is some best practices for single page apps. As you're probably all aware, a single page app runs predominantly in the browser. Uh, in fact, in many cases, there is no uh, the, the traditional sense of having a server client, um, not a server client, a, a server browser uh, application where you might have PHP or Python in the background, for example, or even Node.js. Uh, single page apps are mostly contained within the browser and that's where all the logic happens. And as you know, the browser is essentially an insecure environment. We, we have no control as software developers over what happens in the browser. So I want to go through a few different security best practices of how you can secure single page apps that run in these untrusted environments, but still need to connect to external systems for um, getting data out, uh, augmenting information within your application or allowing interactivity for your users to be able to um, do whatever it is that your application is doing. Maybe you're, uh, it's a simple blog and you want people to post comments and but how do you manage the authorization and authentication around that? So stepping back to that pre-single page app world, uh, we're probably all familiar, and this is actually quite funny because my wife and daughter are in the other room at the moment watching the Avengers. Uh, so when I saw this coming up when I was going through my slides earlier, it was quite, uh, quite apt. So Avengers have a website. I, I don't actually know if they do, but let's pretend they do. They've got a website and any user can come along and make a request to that website. The web server is going to take a request, generate some kind of response. That could be an HTML document, an image, a PDF download, whatever it is. It generates that response and sends it back to the user or rather to the user's browser. Uh, so we're all familiar with that. And single page apps are very, very similar to that. And in fact, they're, they're very uh, un undifferent. They're not different at all in terms of that uh, communications process. Uh, instead, you'll have an API though, because the single page app, the application is running in the browser now rather than on the server. Therefore, uh, all that's coming across is data uh, in order for the browser to be able to render that into some kind of usable form. 
Uh, so you might have your Angular app or you might be using Vue or React or any of the other single page apps. And in fact, this also works if you're doing something in a, a native mobile app or even a home assistant type uh, system. These all need to be able to talk to APIs in order to be able to interact with backend systems. And in the case of all these, they all similarly make a request and get a response back, which is fine for public information of which there's, there's very good reason to have publicly open APIs for which there's no requirement for authentication or authorization. But there's going to come a time when you want to secure those endpoints so that not just anybody can make a request to those. Remember now that the responses are not just usable by your applications, by, by, by anybody or any system that can make an HTTP request. So there are a number of different ways. In the past four or five years, predominantly, it's come down to using JSON Web Tokens. Um, I try to find a small, short description of what a JSON Web Token is. There's lots of really long ones that'll bore you and probably send you to sleep. If you're looking for some reading material to send you to sleep, some of the RFCs around JSON Web Tokens are, are excellent. But to, uh, to make it really concise, essentially it's a method of representing claims. So a claim is, I claim that my name is Ben, or I claim that I have administrative access, or uh, I claim that my email address is benedekri.com. We need to be able to allow two parties to assert these claims between themselves in a secure way, but also in a verifiable way. And that's where JSON Web Tokens come in. Uh, essentially, a JSON Web Token looks a little like this. And you'll see I've color coded it already, just for a bit of, uh, to make it easier. We've got the green part at the top, and that's the header. We've got the blue part, which is the payload. This contains the claims, the things that we assert are true. And then we have a signature, which allows us to verify that nothing's changed in transit. In, very, in, in many ways, it's very much like a driver's license. Not all driver's licenses have all of the characteristics of a JSON Web Token, um, but some do. The, the New York uh, State driver's license is, is one such example. You can see on there, there's a photo, there's information, uh, demographic information about the person, um, which you can then verify in certain ways. So let's have a look at how they are actually similar. So let's have a go at the header. On the right-hand side in the JSON Web Token, we've got the green part, and each each of these two, first two components there, the, the green and the blue parts, they are base64 URL encoded. So while they look like gibberish, any system can decode them into ASCII, and they are both basically JSON payloads. So let's have a look what they look like. On the left-hand side, the header information, the things that tell us uh, that's like the meta information around the identity, we know there's a driver's license, and we know those issued by New York State. So these two bits of information allow us to then work out, well, we know that this is the type of identity it is, therefore we know what to expect in the rest of the information. So we know that every New York, New York driver's license will have a photo. And we know that uh, if, if you can see on there, we've got the sex, the eye color, and the height. Not all of them will, not all driver's licenses will have that, but the header information gives us hints as to what we can get out of the, the, the claims. So the green part on the right, we know that it's an HS-256 algorithm signature for the verification. So HS-256 in this case is HMAC uh, SHA-256. The other option, which is actually more common nowadays, is RS-256, which is an RSA hashing algorithm. I won't go hugely in depth into what the differences between these two particular algorithms, HS and RS, are. Um, there are pros and cons for both. There's a, uh, a link that I'll refer to later and ask, hit me up in the, in the comments questions. If it's something that enough of you want to go through today, I can, um, I can go into that a bit. And then we have a type, which is JWT. Now, I always used to get confused about why you would have the JWT type in the header of a JWT, because you'd have to assume it was a JWT in order to be able to pull out the JWT and verify it. Anyway, it was kind of a loop in my head. It didn't make much sense. But I, uh, recently, there have been reasons to change the type so that you can actually put information into the type to infer that it has to be an RS uh, token. So the, the algorithm will be RS, but also the type has to be RS, which means that it makes it even harder for uh, somebody to modify the content in transit and um, fake signatures, which is one of the downsides to um, if your application doesn't check the, the algorithm header accurately. Um, again, I won't go into too much depth on, on on the intricacies of that. But essentially, this tells us that it's a JSON Web Token and how to verify the signature. Um, the payload, in this case, on the left, we've got the picture, we've got the name uh, and address. Um, it actually says their name is uh, Dr. Ronald, uh, Dr. Donald J. Blake. I'm not sure if that's actually his name. I think he, he looks more like Thor. Um, yes, anyway. 
So I, I don't necessarily believe that the driver's license is wholly accurate and maybe the signature will fail if I, if I checked it out. Uh, get other things like demographics. I mentioned already the sex, the eyes and the height. Uh, and we have things like restrictions. Um, in this particular instance, there are no restrictions, but the restriction might be that you can't ride a motorcycle over a certain power level or over a number, certain number of cc's. So these are all bits of, these are all claims, assertions that we're trying to prove um, and to be able to communicate to another party. On the right hand side, in the blue part, if we base64 URL decode that blue string, uh, and we'll get the JSON back out that gives you uh, a subject. So SUV is a, a common standard for the subject of the identity. And that, when somebody logs in and you get a JSON web token back, that subject will always be the same. Even if they change their email address or their name or their password, the subject will always be the same. And, and it's not really important to this talk, but if you're using identity tokens for authentication within your application, you can rely on that subject to be the key in your database. So you don't need to store the username and password in your database already uh, anymore, which makes you a lot more secure already. You just need to store that subject in the database. And then when a person logs in, you can pull them out based on that that comes back in the JSON web token. Then there's a whole lot of um, less common but somewhat standard naming conventions like given underscore name and family underscore name are used by a lot of the social identity providers like Facebook and Twitter. Uh, if that information is available, they will return that in the JSON web token to you, usually with those those keys. Uh, and then admin here is one that I made up. So because it's JSON, you can put whatever you want in. You can nest that information. You can have a hierarchy of JSON that gets turned into that base64 URL encoded string. And then, as we'll see in the next step, it can get signed so that uh, all the all the assertions can be proved to be uh, unmodified in transit. Of course. You can see from, from the, the green, blue, black part of the top there that this JSON web token is already getting fairly long. And if you compare it to uh, an access token, like the opaque access tokens that were like a UUID essentially, or like 40, 50 characters of randomish looking text, they were fairly short. 50 characters is fairly short uh, in, in terms of adding that in as a, an authentication header. Uh, once your payload in the JSON web token gets large, obviously the, you're sending that every time uh, for the access token, you're sending that every time to the API, and you want to make sure that you're not putting too much into the JSON web token. The more you put in, the more you're slowing down your application, or rather the, the amount of time it takes for a request to be made from the browser to your API. And then going on to the signature, so the black part here isn't actually base64 euro encoded. It is the, um, actually no, it probably is, but it's not JSON when you break it down. Uh, on the left-hand side, you've got the, the driver's license, and you can verify that the driver's license is uh, issued by the issuer that you assume it to be based on certain marks, like the holographic um, uh, image in the background. And sometimes when you hold a UV light over certain documents, it'll glow in certain ways. And it's very hard to be able to forge that. Now, in this particular instance, it's only proving that the card wasn't forged. I mean, that the card was made by the um, the the people like in, in this case the New York State um, Driving Authority. Um, but of course, I mean you could technically get in there and modify the J in the name and write something else in it. If that wasn't noticed, then that, that would get passed. With a digital signature, we're a lot more secure. We actually take the header and the payload, and then uh, because we're using HS256, which requ requires a shared passphrase, the passphrase is passed in at the hashing um, point. So we're creating a hash for the signature. And now any system that knows their passphrase can take the header and take the payload, concatenate them together and hash them with that known password. And if the signature it creates is the same as the token it received, then it knows that the token hasn't been modified, which is a lot more than we can say for the driver's license. So how does this work in practice? So let's have a look at, uh, at Thor. He's down on Earth, he's been here for a while. The Avengers have sorted out a number of things. I think you remember the part in the movie where there's nothing much to do, and he's not sure whether he should go home or just chill and relax. He decides he's going to chill and relax, so he wants to go to the bar. But he doesn't have ID, and he's uncertain whether or not the bouncer is going to let him in. So he goes off to his local uh, driving authority, and he says, I would like a, a driver's license, please. I would like some form of ID. Here's a whole lot of forms that I filled out and he sends them off to the authority, who then probably take three to four weeks to process it, and then eventually send him back some kind of identification. He's then able to go to the bouncer, give the card to the bouncer, the bouncer looks at the card, and she determines that the uh, the card is, is valid. So, uh, yep, that's fine, gives, gives him the thumbs up, 
um, essing through. Now the advantage here is that you can use the card again when he get, gets to the actual bar inside. He's gotten past the bouncer into the building. You can use the same ID with the bar to verify that he's actually allowed to get a drink, not just get into the building. So this is where it's a bit similar to JSON Web Tokens in that you can reuse the token for multiple recipients of that token in order to verify who you are and certain claims about you. But what if he didn't want to wait three to four weeks for the card to arrive? I mean, by this time, he's probably going to have been uh, called back to Asgard and, and he's got another challenge on his hands. So he decides instead to go to some dodgy character down a back lane somewhere and say, look, I really need to get to the bar tonight. Do you have any fake ID on you that I can buy? Here's a big wad of cash. And the person down the back of the lane, look, I, I probably wouldn't do this, but Thor's probably okay. He's big and strong. He, he'd be okay. He's probably not going to get into too much trouble. Um, you could probably argue that he might even be able to get it without paying, but he's he's a he's a good guy. He's going to pay. Uh, and in return, he gets a slightly dodgy but good-looking bit of identity and heads down to the bar. Hands his driver's license over to the bar um, and uh, over to the bouncer. The bouncer has a look at it, runs it through a scanner, which in some states you have scanners to verify driver's licenses, which is quite cool. And she notices that up on screen comes an alert. Um, this is a falsified bit of information. So, no, nope, hands up, cannot pass. Uh, I think I'm, I'm probably crossing stories here, but the staff coming down, you shall not pass, is probably something that happened at that point. No bar for four. So that's the theory of how the token um, uh, communication works. You have an authority that provides the token to you, and you have a, a recipient uh, or a consumer of that token that will use it in order to verify your identity. So how does that work back in a single page app world? It's got a single page app, and uh, we're talking to the uh, Avengers API, and somebody wants to make an SOS request. They're in, in need of help. Um, please send somebody to rescue me. And the server responds, status 401, unauthorized. Don't know who you are. That's not very helpful. So the next step is uh, you then obviously have to log in. So they'll send uh, authentication information to the API or to the server, uh, and in response, they will get a token. So that little um, orange icon there. There's no token, there's no icon or emoji yet for a JSON web token. That's actually the Japanese symbol for open for business. So I'm just using that instead as a token at the moment. Sensor of state is 200 and the JSON web token, which always starts EY, which is the open squiggly brace over the header, returns that back uh, to your application. The application can then go back and make the SOS request again. And you'll note here that we're passing in the extra header. It's an authorization header and we're taking the JSON web token and we're prepending it with the word bearer. So this is now a bearer token. We're passing that in as the header of the request. And the response is now status 200. OK, we know who you are. You're authenticated. The message is OK. And the Avenger we're going to send to help you is the Hulk. Excellent. We're going to be saved. So look, there's a whole lot of different HTTP libraries out there, uh, fetch type libraries, even the built-in fetch nowadays in most of the browsers, uh, the most recent browsers. So, but this is the, the general kind of look of what you're going to do. You're going to make a request, a post request, or a, a get, or whatever kind of request you're making to an endpoint, you're going to pass in the body of what you want to send with it, unless there's a get, get request, obviously. And then all you need to do is add in here, I might be able to use my mouse, there we go, um, this header information. So this first part here is probably uh, what you're all familiar with anyway. And then you just add an extra header in here saying authorization is the, the bearer, and you just pass in the JWT that's been passed into your application. So. Let's take this one step further and have a look at how you can use something like Auth0 or an external authentication system to not even have to write the tokenization stuff into your API or your application in the first place. So you might have your API already and you want to start adding authentication stuff. Um, you can download, uh, like for Express, for example, there's the JWT, Express JWT extension uh, and a couple of others that will help you validate uh, JSON Web tokens that come in uh, automatically or very easily. Uh, so your application can, can send those through, but you still need some way of uh, authenticating somebody, having a password management mechanism, um, password resets, creation, and obviously the token creation and, and issuing as well. So for that, you can use your own login server. This could be, like I say, Auth0. It could be there's a whole lot of off-the-shelf products like um, Keycloak. Uh, there's, there's various other providers who, who do token-based authentication in the cloud as well. So what happens is your application will log into the login server instead, provide the credentials to the login server. The login server will then return that JSON web token. So in this case, it's going to return an ID token and an access token. What we saw before was the ID token. It has assertions about who I am. 
the access token has assertions about what I can do with APIs, including who, can, who the intended recipient is. In this case, I would get an access token that includes api.avengers.com as an intended recipient so that that API can, can use this token. And when that token gets sent in with a request, the API verifies it locally. It doesn't need to talk to the login server at all because it can verify it based against the signature and um, return the document that was requested. Uh, the next time somebody logs in, or the next time somebody makes a request rather, uh, and this could happen if somebody refreshes the page, comes back to the application, right click opens in a new tab, uh, the, the request to the author authorization endpoint can be made, but there can be a cookie already between the browser and the authentication server like Auth0, so that you can automatically be logged back in and a token gets returned without the user actually having to log in again. So this, this affords the, the automatic login or the remember me kind of uh, uh, aspect that most applications have. And again, you can use that token and get the response back. Now, the downside is that this point here where we're making this request, if you think about the user's experience, they're going to be redirected to login.avengers.com. They'll probably get a white screen. They'll be logged in automatically. The token will be returned to your application. Your application will then have to re-render from scratch and then send the information off to the API. So you're going to get that flicker effect, which isn't ideal. So there's actually a... Um, uh, a mechanism that used to be used, and, and look, it, it still is, so I'm going to talk about it anyway, but if we have time at the end, I'm going to get my overhead projector uh, document reader in and we'll do a little bit of sketching just to describe something that changed literally about two weeks ago. Uh, it's not changed, it's an addition uh, as an alternative way of making this a smoother process. So the way that um, it has historically been done up until about two weeks ago is that rather than uh, making the request by redirecting to the login server, we would do what's called a silent re-authentication. And in this case, what happens is your, it's, it's all built into the Auth0 SDK, so you don't need to worry about it if you're using Auth0. The application, uh, the SDK within your application will do half of this for you. It basically generates an iframe off, uh, out of the view, viewport. So the user's not gonna see it, generates this iframe, which makes a request to uh, your login server. That will then do the whole, oh yeah, I found the cookie, here's the JSON web token. And rather than redirect, it uses the post message API built into all the browsers to send a message from the iframe to the parent. And that then injects the JSON web tokens back into your application. So it's silent and it's transparent and the user doesn't realize what's happening. Now, of course, if a token can't be generated because the cookies expired or the credentials have changed or the credentials changing wouldn't, wouldn't break that, um, but maybe the account's been suspended or, or a number of other reasons. Um, then the response that gets sent by, uh, by uh, the post message API would obviously be some kind of um, authentication failed so that your application can then handle that and show actually do the redirect to the login page. But most of the time, if somebody does a right click open in a new tab, they've already got an active session and you don't want them to have to get that flicker. So it makes the experience a lot nicer for them. Uh, then of course that token can be used and returned. So some resource for you, resources for you. Uh, to kind of a bit more of a deep dive into the, the areas that I've discussed today. General JWT resources, jwt.io uh, is a great resource. It's also a, um, a pretty good tool in and of itself. Um, if we open now, I don't know whether my sharing worked properly. Yes, it did. Okay, so you can see that. Um, jwt.io is basically a um, a website where you can paste in your JSON web tokens on the left, and it will tell you all about what is in those JSON web tokens on the right. Um, depending on the algorithm you're using, here we've got HS256, so if you knew what the passphrase was, when you paste it in there, it'll even tell you if the signature is valid. You can generate your own. It's got information about all the different signing um, uh, algorithms supported by different libraries. It's a really good resource uh, to learn more about what JSON web tokens are. Um, how do I make that full screen again without starting from the beginning? Just like that. Excellent. Um, the signing algorithms that I mentioned earlier, so there's HS256 and RS256. There's a whole lot of others as well, but those are the predominant ones that, that we use at all zero. Uh, if you go to bit.ly slash jwt-alg for algorithm, and there's a, a free download book there about, um, about the differences there. Actually, no, I think that one's a blog. The next one is a handbook. So this is a book that somebody at all zero actually wrote. Um, if there's anything you don't know about JWT, it'll be in that book. So if, there's, if you really want to get a deep dive into JSON Web Tokens, um, that's a really good resource. To be honest, I haven't read it end-to-end, -end, but the bits I have read uh, are really quite good. 
So in summary, single page application security is mostly about the authorization. Uh, the authentication you can hand, you handle off to a third party, but once you have that JSON web token for the access token, you can then quite comfortably make sure that um, the, the token is valid and APIs can consume that. JSON web tokens are excellent for securing single page applications for exactly that reason. Uh, there are a whole lot of libraries as well that make, make this so much easier for you. It's not just Auth0, but all the other providers out there will have good libraries um, and documentation that will help. Well, most of them have good libraries and documentation uh, that uh, that will get you through uh, getting started with that. Um, and most importantly, while a security guard can't stop for, your server can refuse requests based on uh, the, the valid JWT. So say, for example, the security guard hadn't noticed uh, that the identity was that the card was invalid, or maybe it was a valid card but had been modified. You can't do that with JSON web tokens because of that digital signature. Um, so if we have time, I think we're kind of maybe five minutes or so left. Is is that right? Well, we've currently been alive for thirty-one minutes, and I think we started for for five. So um, yeah, I'll just switch my camera over. And I'm happy to be interrupted by the host uh, to uh, to keep moving if I need to. So I did mention, there you go, you should be able to see that now. I did mention that um, the way that it used to work is you would have your um, your application here, your single page app, and there would be this out of view iframe over here. And then you'd have your, um, you know, let's see if I can draw an icon well, something like that. I'm really bad at drawing my own company's icon. That's really embarrassing. Let's call, let's call that all <laughs> Auth0. That was terrible. So the iframe makes a request to Auth0 and it gets a response and then it pushes the, the token up here. Now, one of the issues that we solved um, by implementing this new mechanism for uh, getting this, this, new, this new token is a lot of browsers, in order to stop tracking, of um, of people across sites is essentially, I mean, this this here, th this iframe is actually loading an Auth0 page. So essentially, this is a third party party uh, third third party website running inside your application here. So this is treated as a third party cookie, that cookie that we had, chocolate chip. So uh, a lot of browsers now, in order to stop um, tracking and surveillance, are disabling third party cookie sending which means if this cookie isn't sent, Auth0 can't lock you in, therefore this flow doesn't work. And it's not just Auth0 has this problem, all of the identity providers out there who provide this mechanism of transparent re-authentication are having that issue. Um, so uh, what, what's happening instead now is we've got a second version and there's the uh, Auth0 uh, SPA-JS, that's an S. Uh, Auth0 spar.js library um, was just recently updated to 1. Point, I think it was 1.17 or 1.18 uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and it, it has something inside called um, refresh token rotation. I won't write that out in full because you won't be able to read my handwriting anyway. Um, but if you do look for a search for refresh token uh, rotation, the um, there's a couple of pages on Auth0 that will tell you about that. So historically, refresh tokens, and I, I won't go into time, time permitting reasons, I won't go into why, but refresh tokens generally aren't stored on single page apps because they, are, they allow anybody who has them to get a new token. And because the single page app environment is an untrusted, uh, untrusted environment, we can't store the refresh tokens in there. There is a way uh, that the identity community has um, basically reinvented the way that refresh tokens work for this particular case that allows us to still have refresh tokens for single page apps now. So this new library here will use refresh tokens and then it will use, if I can draw a cog, um, the web workers that are built into the web browser to make a request to Auth0 over here. And because those web workers aren't using, um, then, then because it works differently to an iframe, uh, those cookies are a lot more likely to be um, savable and if they're not we have now also started storing the tokens the refresh tokens in local storage so basically there's a new way when i was saying over here that iframes are the way we do transparent re-authentication that's not the case 100 percent of the time anymore old legacy applications um 
and even some of the new ones being built will still do this. The issue happens when your browser doesn't support third-party cookies, so you might need to look into using the, the new library. If you've got any questions about that at all, if you're using Auth0 already and you're, you're hitting issues on this, hit me up. Um, probably not in the Q&A. Um, at Ben Decroy is my, let's switch back to my other camera. At Ben Decroy is my Twitter handle. Hit me up there um, uh, because it's going to take a bit more time than just the next 10 minutes or so. So I'm not sure how much sense that made. To be honest, it was um, it was just designed, and because I couldn't update my slides earlier today, it was just designed to give you a heads up that there is a different way of doing it. I'll just, um, Loki sucks. Yes, Krishna, he certainly does. Loki sucks. Um, what other questions do we have over here? Yep. Uh, uh, how to handle JWT token size grows over the, the multiple requests. So the JWT token size is defined by the by the person creating it. It's generated once. You don't, it's it's not like a string where you add things as you go along necessarily. I mean, okay, so theoretically what you could do is you can get an access token from an, an authentication provider and then your application could consume that access token and send it to an API. That API could verify the token, unpack it, add some stuff in, re-sign it and send it off to another API. So you can chain and you can add more information in. Um, there's, look, the, the only way to control it at, at that point is being sensible as a software developer. Uh, you, if it's like if you had a, a, a max int two fifty five, a max length two fifty five string in a database, you as a programmer would need to make sure that whatever you're pushing in is not over two fifty five, or that if it is, you don't care about losing it. Obviously, the bigger the JSON vector okay. gets, the bigger the header becomes, uh, and you don't want to get into that point where you're sending a megabyte of extra header information with every request. Yeah, so that will take more time to. Uh, get the response uh, post the request totally yeah i mean it's yep. you're looking at your upload speeds now we don't usually think of upload speeds when we make http requests because generally they're in the order of kilobytes um, mm -hmm. a post request might be 20 100 kilobytes if you're adding a whole load on in the header that's that's not a good place to be uh, so just being sensible about it as a developer when you're implementing them if you like one thing you can do with Auth0, for example, is you can do a post authentication hook within Auth0 and run a rule to add extra information in based on rules that you define. And you could potentially make the JSON web token that gets sent by Auth0 really big in the first place. But again, that's a design decision that you're making. So just be, be sensible and, and think carefully about those types of design decisions when you're pushing information into the, the tokens. Okay, that's good. Yeah, can we set time? Uh, moving on to the tokens? next question. Oh, yeah. I like the That's little question from Rajesh. Papa, nice. <laughs> Hi, Rajesh. <laughs> uh, yes, you can. And in fact, uh, it's one of the core designs behind a JSON Web Token. So uh, an ID token will often have a, a, a timeout or an expiry of, I don't know, a week. Or it's it's not overly important to a certain extent how long the identity token uh, lives for. I would recommend that anything you put into the payload of an identity token, you consider as being public information. It's quite possible that this is going to be consumed by um, the, the single page app and then bits of information like the name or the profile image are taken out and rendered on the page. Uh, theoretically, I, I like to think, think to myself this way anyway, um, I would like to consider that if my identity token got dumped plain text onto the page, that I wouldn't be worried about anything that's inside it. All it does is it represents my identity. Access tokens are different, though, because an access token getting into the wrong hands is something that then a third party can use against your API to make a request uh, on your behalf. So that's obviously where the danger lies. So in this case, uh, the the time you uh, and with Auth0, as, as I'm sure with, with all the other authentication providers, you can specify the timeout for the access token. Uh, I think by default it's a day, maybe. I think you can push it out up to three days. Um, I know there was something in our product backlog for pushing it out even further than that. Um, but if it expires after three days, then you can use the refresh token to get a new one, or your user might have to log in again. Um, but when considering how long that time should be, consider the risk profile of using that information. And one example I like, somebody once told me that Netflix has access tokens with a um, an expiry of a day. Now, for an ID token, I'd be quite happy for that. For an access token, for a lot of my applications, I wouldn't. But if you think about the risk of somebody divulging their access token for Netflix, what's the worst that can happen? Somebody else can watch a movie. 
Netflix isn't going to go broke. So from their perspective, it's actually their, their end user experience is better by having a long mm -hmm. expiry for an access token. Because when they go back and they open up Netflix on, on their, their TV, it plays straight away. It doesn't have to go off and get a new token. So the experience is better and the risk is low if it gets compromised. If it's an internet banking application though, I would be arguing for a five minute, maybe even a two minute or a one minute expiry. So yes, I've got to get a new token a lot more often, but it's keeping the application a lot more secure. If that token gets lost, there's a window of uh, maybe the remaining 45 seconds of the minute since it was issued for somebody to do something bad with that. Okay. So I got a question. Yes. Uh, yeah. So how to prevent uh, session hijacking in JWT? So they, I'm, I'm going to assume that question is based around the, the cookie session with Auth0 being hijacked mm -hmm. as opposed to any other, like it's not a hijack for your application or your, your backend servers or anything. Is that, is that the angle of your question? OK, so it, it, it's going to work in the same way how cookies work uh, when it comes to hijacking. So yeah, essentially, I mean, the, the only place where in the presentation I had cookies was between the browser and the authentication server. So if the authentication server is also your web application server or your API, mm -hmm. then obviously you want to be really careful about what those cookies represent. Um, the other thing that you need to make sure of is that any server that um, that has cookies or, or has a session cookie is really secured in terms of the web interfaces that it gives to the user because obviously the issue we have with session hijacking predominantly is around rogue add-ons in browsers or cross-site scripting injections where somebody might inject a whole lot of javascript into your login page or your login server in order to hijack that that cookie right mm -hmm. so the way that auth0 keeps you more secure is that because the authentication happens at uh, yourname.auth0.com not at yourname.com we have full control over the HTML that gets rendered. We have full control over the libraries that we use, uh, the, the modules that get used to render the, those login pages. And we have 100 developers making sure that the risk there is minimized as much as possible. So theoretically, it should be really hard to do a session hijack. The other thing okay. is that because it's all on one server and it's all generated by our server, they're all HTTP cookies as well. So if you do get a cross-site injection at some point, JavaScript is going to be able to read those cookies because they're HTTP and secure only. So JavaScript has no access. So we, we do another things on the login pages to make it a lot more secure. If you were rolling your own authentication system um, to do the JSON Web Token generation, all of that, you would need to make sure, obviously, that that happens within your application too. OK. Yeah. Thank you. And That's all right. uh, we have one last. Yep. Couple more. Yeah. So uh, we need to do a lot of uh, uh, this validation in our backend, basically, just to make sure the JWT is not uh, hijacked. So we can check it in uh, terms of uh, browser ID or so, IP sometimes. Um, so the thing with JSON Web Tokens, and this is one thing where some people often say that JSON Web Tokens are a bad idea. Um, I don't think. Mm -hmm. The bad idea is necessarily the right view on this. It's just different, and there are different ways of mitigating. So one of the things is that a JSON Web Token can be verified in isolation because the the signature can be verified without having to talk to the edit, uh, to the token issuer. So in this case, the API can look at the token. It knows the key to generate the signature, and it has a token. Therefore, it can take the header and the payload of that token, generate its own signature, and and match that against the signature of the actual JSON Web Token that it received. And if they match, then then it's valid. And then it can check the expiry, and it can check the um, the so another field in an access token called the audience. So the API needs to be listed in the array of audiences in order to, for it to be an intended recipient. So it can do all these verification checks to make sure that the token is intended for that API, still valid, hasn't expired, all of these things. Now, one question is, what happens if I want to invalidate that? If, if I was using an opaque token, then the API would need to go off to the token issuer and say, hey, I've just received this opaque token. Can you verify that it's valid? And it has to make that round trip every time. Whereas in this case, it never makes that round trip. So therefore, you can't invalidate it at, the, at a, a centralized level. So one thing you can do, um, because token um, invalidation is 
arguably a fairly rare occurrence. Most of the time, tokens are fine, so you don't need to, to invalidate very often. You can implement your own token invalid, uh, invalid token list, which can be like a memcache or a database somewhere of the actual tokens. And you basically say, if I want to invalidate it, I add it into this list. Now, the advantage with the expiries in the tokens is that you only have to remember token invalidation for as long as the token is valid. As soon as the token expires, you don't need to remember that it's been invalidated because it's expired. So this list is fairly short because it'll only, like it's a, it's a rolling list of the invalidated tokens over the last hour or day or however long tokens last. Okay. Yeah, we have one last question. Uh, we have like two minutes left uh, for our sure. question and answer session. So you can go through the uh, information first, which he put on uh, the comments. Yep. Uh, it's from Krishna Sai. OK, so we're using Identity Server, used as a common yeah. backend app for generating the JSON web token. Um, so when you say, I don't think it matters, but I'm assuming that's Identity Server, which is the part of the .NET framework for generating the JSON web token. We have a few backend APIs which use that API for authentication and authorization, right? On every request, we need to validate the token from the common backend app, which is adding the response time. Right, is there a way to cache the token in the consumer backend apps to avoid hitting the common yeah. app for the token validation? So I assume, uh, Krishna, that you're not using JSON web tokens unless you need to somehow validate a JSON web token hasn't been invalidated. Um, I'm going to make the assumption unless you want to add a, a follow-up in, in the questions, I'm going to make the assumption that you're not using JSON web tokens because obviously in most cases you wouldn't need to do that callback to the um, the identity server to make that, that validation. Uh, if you are using opaque tokens and you're you're sending that off for the round, round request, Robin, you could do some caching, but the problem you're, you're going to hit then, so one thing that that often happens, and by the sounds of it, you're not relying on this. But one thing that often happens is you'll make a request to verify that a token is valid, and as a response, you might get additional information. If you don't need that, or if that doesn't change uh, frequently enough, then of course you can cache that. Then you fall into the whole caching validation issue that JSON Web Tokens face, that it's uh, if you're caching it, then there's no way of making sure that it hasn't been invalidated at the, the issuer level. So if you don't have any concerns about having to invalidate tokens, before they expire, and any information that gets returned as part of the verification step doesn't change in a significant amount of time, ideally within the expiry of, of the token, um, then sure, cache. But just be very careful because caching, as we all know, caching is a, a picture of what something was like before. Uh, you, if, if you can rely on historic remembrances of data, then, um, then yeah, go for it but proceed with caution. OK, that's awesome. Uh, thanks for uh, answering all the questions, uh, Ben. That's all right. It was fun. Thanks for the questions, and, everyone. Uh, yep. There was something in there that I haven't had before, which is always exciting. Gets my brain ticking. <laughs> <laughs> OK, and thanks for your time uh, for the talk. And we have uh, Alexander as well uh, with us. And uh, Maniraj, let's take a quick uh, group picture. I think Alexander, oh, yeah, here he is. <laughs> okay. So thanks for joining, Alexander. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, can yeah. you hear me? Yeah. Ah, okay, cool. Yeah, I took the picture. Thank you Wonderful. so much. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Thanks for your time. You're welcome. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Yeah. You too. Yes, Alexander, you can go ahead with your uh, talk. OK, cool. Yeah, once you share your stuff, I can add it to the stream. Yep, here you go. OK, can you hear? Uh, can, can you see the picture? Hello? Uh, can you see can you see the slide yes yes i'm able to see 
Okay. Okay. I will. I will yeah. drop uh, camera uh, just to uh, keep the bandwidth. Okay. If sure. You, if you don't mind. Yes. Um, I was a bit late because uh, I confused uh, the time zone difference, but uh, I'm here and this is good. <laughs> uh, okay, let's start. Uh, definitely every one of you knows that Angular is heavily using ArcGIS library. Uh, so question of unit testing for observables, I think it is quite important. And in this talk, I will review all the tools uh, uh, that you can use for that. and you can choose which tool fits best for your code. And actually, the main uh, purpose is to show you a big picture of possibilities. Each tools you can use and why you can use them uh, and what is the difference between them and how uh, unit testing tools evolved uh, over time. Okay, so my name is Alexander. I'm senior front-end developer and last four years, uh, I've been working in commercial projects that have used an Angular framework and ArcGIS library. So Angular is my main framework for a long time. Also, I'm a writer for Angular and Dev blog and Angular mentor on CodeMentor.io. Uh, I created uh, two video courses, uh, hands-on ArcGIS for web development with the packed web and a free video course, ArcGIS unit testing in Angular. Uh, actually, this uh, talk is based on that course, you can find it. Uh, it it uh, actually contains a bit more details, uh, but this talk is like introduction to the course. Uh, if you already tried to code unit test for observables, um, like me, many a few years ago, then you may be overwhelmed with a variety of methods uh, how you can do that, and which one is right for you. You can see on the screen a few of them. Uh, what is common for them and where they differ, and how to put all of them in one solid picture in your head. Uh, this is what I'm going to bring you uh, in this talk. I will make you understand the system. Uh, there are code samples I will be writing test for uh, in this talk. Uh, they are a bit simplified for learning purposes, but still practical. Uh, I will, not, I will not stop on them here, uh, because we will review them more deep uh, very soon. Uh, before we start diving into unit testing, we should clarify what are schedulers in RxJS. Uh, you already know that observables produce values over time. And the moment when exactly value will be emitted is controlled by a special entity uh, in RxJS, a scheduler. Knowing how schedulers work uh, is very important uh, in understanding how uh, to do unit tests for your async code. Uh, so take a look. Uh, to understand how schedulers work, uh, we have to recall what is JavaScript event loop in the browser. The main entities uh, on this slide is macro task, micro task, and event loop macro task queue. So let's take a look at the code uh, which is being executed to the left. We have three console logs here. Uh, first is unwrapped, usual console log. Second is wrapped in set timeout. And third is called uh, in promise resolve callback. As you see in the browser console, uh, yes, in the browser console, first unwrapped console log is executed. On the second place, we have console log from promise callback. And then on the third place, we have console log from set timeout. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, set timeout. You may ask why? Why is uh, such a sequence? Uh, it is simple. First console log is executed in current active macro task. Uh, console log from set timeout will be run in the next macro task. So browser put it in a queue. But promise callback is scheduled to be run in micro task just after current active macro task. So console log three runs before console log two. That's why output order is one, three, and then two. 
Uh, this code works uh, on this slide. We have actually code that works the same way as code on the previous slide. But here I use RxJS. Uh, to emit values, I use RxJS of function. And in some cases, uh, I provided second optional scheduler param, as you can see. First value is emitted synchronously. Second value is scheduled in front-end loop macro tasks queue. And third value will be emitted at micro task just after current macro task. Uh, providing scheduler to a regjs of function actually does the trick. Uh, so let's take a look at official definition from a regjs GitHub repo. A scheduler is a data structure that controls when emission uh, then when emissions are delivered. Oh, one second. A bit. Uh, it means that we can emit data synchronously uh, if we don't use scheduler or use queue scheduler. We can schedule emission in micro task just after current macro task if we use ASIP scheduler. Actually, ASIP scheduler just wraps the emission in promise callback. And when we use async scheduler, data will be emitted in other, in other macro task at once or with some specified delay. Actually, it uses set interval under the hood. Uh, the main challenges we, uh, can met, we can meet during unit testing of observables are data are emitted asynchronously, more than one value may be emitted, and order of values may matter. Values are emitted with specified delay, and sometimes in prod cases, the, this delay can be quite big, like 30 seconds, minute, and more. Uh, translating these challenges to the browser event loop terminology, we might say that we should be ready to write unit tests for such cases for synchronous code. Uh, but testing synchronous code is relatively easy. We will not review it here. For async code that emits in next micro task, like promises do. Uh, third, for async code that emits in next macro task, which is placed in event event loop queue, possibly with some delay. Also, a combination of observables which are frequently used in Angular code. Also, there are two more special schedulers. It is a virtual time scheduler, uh, which allows to execute all delayed scheduled emission tasks instantly, keeping the emission order. Because if we have some emission which are delayed with quite big interval, uh, we cannot wait uh, when we do unit test. We should uh, emit them instantly. And virtual time scheduler can help us. Also, test scheduler. It is a subclass of virtual time scheduler, but with additional methods for unit testing. We will talk about them also in, the, in this talk more deep. Uh, one more thing I wanted to pay attention to. Uh, RxJS provides scheduler classes, but also you can get existing instances of scheduler classes, which are used by RxJS operators internally. Getting these, these instances will help us to change uh, scheduler behavior for testing purposes. The rule of thumb here is if it is a class, the name starts with capital letter. But if it is an instance, uh, then its name starts with a small letter. Actually, examples you can see on the slide. Uh, to find out more on, on the topic of browser event loop or RxJS schedulers, uh, there are uh, some videos you can take a look uh, later uh, by Philip Roberts and Michael Hladke. Okay, that's it about schedulers. And now let's start reviewing testing methods for observables. You know a regjs of function, I hope. It creates observable that emits value or values. Uh, here in this example, a regjs of function works synchronously, just like a loop, emitting all the values in the same event loop macro task. So once we subscribe to it, all the values will be produced and we can easily check them in assertion expression. But things become harder if we need to test 
async code. Let's take a look. Uh, here's an example. Uh, I changed the bit get range function. So now all the values will be emitted in different macro tasks. Why? Because at the time we call just mean exp oh sorry. Uh, so the code uh, of test below will fail. And uh, why it is failed? Because uh, when we call just mean expect function, not all the values are actually emitted. So sync testing is not applicable here. Uh, but how can we test async code? And today we have a plenty of tools for that. Uh, Jasmine framework provides a special done callback for testing async code. How to apply it to observables? When specific test is executed, Jasmine holds and waits until done callback is called. So if data is provided asynchronously, we subscribe to observable and run assertion after we got all the data. And then we run done callback to say Jasmine that we can continue. Let's take a look at code. Uh, so uh, here uh, in the code to the left, we make HTTP call with this HTTP get function. And if it succeeds, it will repeat HTTP calls two more times after specified timeout. So obviously async scheduler is used by our XGS delay operator. And here, first drawback of Jasmine down callback is becoming obvious. We cannot test code that has some big delay times. Since uh, test will run too long, but how to omit it? We can provide smaller delay time. That's why in test code to the right, you can see that we call get data with a very little value. And we just uh, subscribe to range. Uh, which is actually the observable, uh, which was returned by get data function, uh, and get all the values. Oh, uh, get all the values, and on complete callback, we uh, just check that we get all these values. Oh, uh, the only yes, the only drawback here I didn't. Uh, provide mock for HTTP get, which just return the some value emissions. Sorry for that. Uh, okay, so Jasmine with done callback has such benefits. It is a simple, uh, and Jasmine doesn't have to wait long to test to be completed. It is good for single values, but as we saw, some range of values can be tested also if we add them to array. Drawbacks, this method is not visual. We can test only final result. And we have to provide very small delays for testing, uh, not to block Jasmine uh, for too long. Uh, you may ask, but how to test code that uses big time delays? And here is uh, where virtual time scheduler can help us. Uh, you remember that virtual time scheduler allows to flush all scheduled emissions instantly, keeping the emission order. So we should not wait. Uh, we emulate as if time passed, but actually uh, uh, only like milliseconds passed. Uh, so we can use it for RxJS code with big emission delays. Also, you can see that virtual time scheduler inherits from async scheduler. Uh, we can replace async scheduler is instance with virtual time scheduler instance in our tests. Uh, a bit, uh, let's dig a bit deeper to virtual time scheduler, actually. If we want to emit values with some specified delays, uh, async scheduler is used. Async scheduler uses set interval internally to schedule value emissions. Uh, for testing such code, we need to make somehow run schedule tasks instantly but with keeping order of values. Virtual time scheduler can do that. If we replace async scheduler with virtual time scheduler in our function, we can achieve that. You remember that for off function or for some other RxJS function, we can provide a scheduler. Here is the steps for writing unit tests with virtual time scheduler. 
before we go to the call. We, we feed virtual time scheduler to our code instead of async scheduler. Uh, then we get observable and subscribe to it. After that, we call flush method of virtual time scheduler instance uh, and check the final result. Okay, uh, so here is the code. Uh, we call repeat when to rerun source observable uh, two times except first run. Pay attention that I added one more argument to the code, a scheduler, uh, to be able to feed in virtual time scheduler instance. If we test it with just Mintan callback method, it will take two seconds until test is over. But if we use virtual time scheduler to, uh, to get data function, we may get result instantly. Uh, pay attention that we call scheduler.flush method just before we call expect. Okay, test passed now. Uh, let's sum up. Virtual time scheduler method has such pros. We can provide real production delay values. Uh, not uh, because if you remember in the previous uh, Jasmine Dunn callback, we provided very small values. Here we can provide real values. We can test even hard coded values since time spans will pass instantly. Uh, but this method has such imperfections. It allows to test only final result and additional method params is needed. So we violate uh, code test segregation. Uh, now I want to share uh, some trick with you which will help you uh, to do unit testing better. Use an extra method argument to provide scheduler is instance is not convenient. It violates code test segregation since we have to add something in working code just for testing purposes. To, to avoid this, RxJS version 6 provides a special dot delegate property in scheduler instance. Uh, so if I know that my code uses async scheduler and want to make RxJS to use another scheduler instance instead, I just have to assign async scheduler dot delegate property with that virtual time scheduler instance. And then don't forget uh, to drop that value also. Let's take a look at code. So to the left, you can see our previous code that, uh, feed, that feeds scheduler to the function. To the right, we reassign async scheduler delegate uh, property. And now we uh, can call our function without that additional argument. And test, uh, test looks a bit longer, but there is nothing test specific in our working code now. Angular also has another possible way of testing observable that uses async scheduler. For that uh, method, fake async helper function is used. So what is the difference between testing with virtual time scheduler and fake async? How they differ? Uh, let's take a look uh, at, uh, at this slide. You already know that we can flush uh, emitted events with virtual time scheduler instance. But there is one more way. Uh, Angular has a test helper function fake async, fake async which mocks set interval in the browser. And when we call special function named tick, mock it set interval executes uh, all the scheduled tasks instantly. Uh, so we might not wait actual time. So what is the difference? Virtual time scheduler flushes the events on a RxJS level, but fake async uh, make the flush on set interval level. So more deep level. Uh, how does fake fake async work? It uses fake async test zone spec zone instead of standard ng zone. Uh, in that zone, standard browser API like set interval, set timeout, and promise are patched. And when we call tick, 
tasks from interval queue is executed instantly. Uh, you can check implementation in the uh, listed files. So let's go to our code and tests. Uh, here is the example. We call get data function without specific scheduler. And we provide quite a big delay value. So repeat calls will be scheduled to be done in 30 seconds. Uh, this means that in usual time, we would wait for 60 seconds until observable completes. But with tick function, uh, we can run them instantly. Now test passed. Uh, fake async uh, has the same pros and cons as virtual time scheduler. We can provide real production delay values. We can test even hard-coded delay values. Uh, and test becomes a little bit smaller. And one more benefit. You shouldn't know all the ERIC.js internals to use it. And imperfection, uh, it allows to test only final result. Can we do better? Uh, before we start getting deeper uh, in another testing methods uh, using test scheduler class, we have to understand how test scheduler differs from virtual time scheduler. Test scheduler inherits from virtual time scheduler. So you may guess that we can use test scheduler in the same way as virtual time scheduler instance. And this is right thought. Uh, we can take our test with virtual time scheduler and replace its instance with test scheduler instance. But there are some small things you have to know before doing this. Test scheduler and virtual time scheduler has a special max frames param. It determines a time depth for executing scheduled tasks, uh, the task which you will flush uh, to run them instantly. Time scheduler max frame value is set to 750 milliseconds. This is done as a sanity check for marble testing. Uh, we will talk about marble testing a bit later. So if your code delays are bigger than that value, you should reassign it. The scheduler also demands assertion expression when you want to create an instance. It makes the scheduler testing framework agnostic, which is quite cool. OK, for this example, we will review how to use the scheduler instead of virtual time instead of virtual time scheduler pay attention that we call get data with 30 seconds argument so it will take 60 seconds to complete result observable okay here is the code let's compare uh, let's compare the same uh, test code with virtual time scheduler and test scheduler we create instance and provide mocks Uh, subscribe to result observable. Here's a result observable and we subscribe to it. And call flush method. Virtual time scheduler test will pass, but test scheduler code will fail. Why? Remember, I told you about max frame value. Actually, it is a value in milliseconds to process scheduled tasks with delays not more than this, but more, not more than this time. So to fix our tests, let's reassign it. And now test will pass. OK, so drawbacks. Uh, using test scheduler like virtual time scheduler has same imperfection. It is not visual and we can check only final result. But test scheduler is capable to solve this as well. Uh, and we are going to next testing method, which is more visual and allows to write tests in more obvious way. Uh, it is called marble testing. In that method, all observable sequences are represented as marble diagrams. So what is marble diagram? It is a domain-specific language for ERIC.js 
to help you visually represent values emitted over time in your test. Uh, here you can see such a diagram for repeat when, for example, uh, which is uh, this operator is used uh, in our code on the slide. It looks informative and clear. So how to use it? Uh, test scheduler has a special methods, uh, which gives us possibility to create tests uh, with marble diagrams. Even more, test scheduler supports two ways to run such tests. Let's go deeper. Here's our code again. Uh, this is our main <laughs> code we test today. Imagine how marble diagram for this example may look like. We emit first value, then we have some delay. Uh, after that, second value is emitted, delay, third val value, and completion. As you may guess, uh, uh, actually, you can see the diagram which represents uh, that sequence just below the code. As uh, one symbol in the diagram represents one time frame. Each frame here in that example equals 10 milliseconds. Parenthesis here tells us that value emission and completion event happens in the same frame. Uh, one more detail to pay attention to. Remember test scheduler max frames limit. You, uh, now you can understand what is it about. It is like saying, hey, think twice, 750 milliseconds marble will be too long, uh, marble diagram. You may think that here max frame represents number of frames, but no, it used as a number of milliseconds. Let's review marble testing with test scheduler with our first example. Okay, first, we create test scheduler instance and assign to async scheduler delegate. You remember that trick, yes? Uh, second step, we provide mocks created with special test scheduler function, create called observable. Uh, we set assertion expression uh, with actual and expected observables. And we call get the scheduler flush method. So let's take a look at uh, closer at some parts of that test. In our code, we create mock for HTTP service call that returns observable. And for marble testing, we use special function of the scheduler, create called observable. Uh, as a first param, we feed marble diagram. In our case, we just emit A and complete observable. But what is A here? Uh, the exact value for A will be taken from mapping object, which is sent as a second param. Uh, marbles has, has a special assertion expression. Expect observable to be. Expect observable accepts one param. It is observable that we want to test. Uh, and to be method waits, uh, mar uh, accepts marble diagram of expected output result and respective mapping object with actually emitted values. Pay attention that we have to provide small delay values here. Why? Because default uh, frame length is just 10 milliseconds. Can we somehow increase it? Yes, but since each symbol in marble diagram represents one frame, this means that emission of event of A value will take bigger time as well, which is not possible in production. Uh, marble, string use, uh, marble strings use special syntax, and here's uh, a small list of possible symbols you can use. Uh, the mostly used ones are dash, which simulates passage of time that equals uh, one frame. In this method, it is 10 milliseconds. Uh, letters from A to Z can represent mapped values that should be emitted. Pipe uh, shows when emission is complete. Uh, here is a doc uh, at the bottom of the slide. You can read more about possible symbols uh, in official ORGS documentation. Uh, 
Also, you can see some test scheduler methods which are used for marble uh, unit testing. There are some of them, but uh, he, uh, here I listed only ones you will, you will be using most of the time. Uh, but you can read more in the provided uh, document also. Now, let's take a look at the code. So, we combine two streams. And combining streams is actually where marble testing uh, really shines. Pay attention to mocket observable marble diagrams. When diagram is visual, it is easy to create expected output diagram. Here is expected. So we emit B, then time passed, then A, then two frames passed, and then we complete sequence. Uh, let's wrap up. This testing method has such benefits. Uh, we can make visual tests where all emitted values are checked, not only final result. Since we reassigned async scheduler delegate property, there is no need for additional scheduler param in tested code. And it also has a drawbacks. Delay values are not production ones, so we should provide small values, uh, not, to block, <coughs> not to block Jasmine for too long. Uh, this is because default marble frame length is 10 milliseconds only. We can increase marble frame length, uh, but it is not convenient and doesn't allow to emulate exact production behavior. Uh, now we will review Jasmine Marbles library. Jasmine Marbles is just a wrapper library for RxJS test scheduler to reduce code boilerplate. So it provides same functionality, which we just reviewed, but make tests a bit shorter. You remember our last example, yes? Uh, now let's transform it to use Jasmine Marbles. OK. So to understand how Jasmine Marbles can reduce code boilerplate, let's compare tests done with Test Scheduler and Jasmine Marbles. In example, with Jasmine Marbles, we should not create a scheduler instance by ourselves. Library does implicitly. Yes, library does it implicitly. Uh, but we still can get the scheduler instance with the scheduler helper function. Get test scheduler. Also, Jasmine pro provides shorter helper function names. Yes, you can see. Uh, just called uh, instead of create called observable. And Flush method is called implicitly by Jasmine Marbles as well. So we shouldn't call it by ourselves. Okay, here is a comparison table of how helper methods are named in test scheduler and to Jasmine Marbles library and in Jasmine Marbles library. They actually same methods under the hood, but uh, they uh, Actually, they are shorter, uh, but they call the same test scheduler methods because Jasmine Marbles just a wrapper uh, around test scheduler methods. Uh, you already noticed that Jasmine Marbles calls test scheduler flush implicitly. How is it implemented? Uh, here is a part of Jasmine Marble source code. So you can see that Jasmine Marble just defines additional after reach handler for that. Uh, where it calls flush. Okay, let's wrap up. Jasmine Marbles has same benefits and drawbacks as the scheduler since it is just a wrapper, uh, but it allows to reduce a bit our test code boilerplate. And Angular official documentation widely used Jasmine Marbles for test examples. One more thing. Uh, what if in our marble test we could provide more exact delay values? Like this. This notation is much more convenient. It operates with the real delay values, and such notation is called time progressive syntax. Let's get deeper. Uh, so, as I told, Jasmine Marbles has this small timings drawback limitation. But starting from RxJS version 6, 
new run method was added to test scheduler, which allows to use uh, time progressive syntax in marble diagrams. We can specify uh, explicitly uh, exact delay values in convenient manner. Uh, let's return to our example. Uh, it would be so great to provide such clear timings in our marble diagram string. And now we can do that. Uh, so let's review the, the example. Uh, the test uh, is created in three steps. Pay attention that we now use scheduler.run method. We wrap our text test actually in scheduler.run. Uh, and test is created in three steps. First, we create test scheduler instance and provide assertion expression. You remember that uh, it allows to make it uh, test framework agnostic. Second step, we call test scheduler run method and provide callback function with our actual test. And third step, inside provided callback, we call assertion expression with expect observable helper function. All the helpers are provided to our callback by test scheduler run method. You may ask, what is the difference between all test scheduler way of testing, which we just uh, reviewed uh, on the previous step, and new test scheduler run method? And here is the comparison. Uh, so frame duration now is one millisecond, unlike 10 milliseconds in all test scheduler way of testing. Flush method is called implicitly. Async scheduler delegate trick is applied implicitly as well, so we shouldn't do that. And uh, we don't have to add scheduler argument to our function. And of course, time progressive syntax, uh, it is a super convenient way of, specific, of uh, providing specific delays in marble diagrams. Okay, let's uh, take a closer look. This is a blueprint of test when we use the scheduler run method. Providing assertion expression to test scheduler allows us to use it uh, with any testing framework, not only with Jasmine, but with Jest, Mocha, etc. And uh, pay attention also uh, to helper function. They are provided now with shorter names, very similar to Jasmine Marble helpers. Uh, hey, Alexander, uh, quick check on time. Oh, okay. I will try to speed up. Yeah, so we got like another five minutes to wrap it up. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, I will try to speed up uh, because I have a few uh, slides also. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, if we run our test now, uh, so what is your gut feeling? Will it pass? But it will not pass. Why? Because there is one more uh, small nuance when we calculate exact values for delays between data emissions. And Kevin uh, Crozer kindly provided his tweet uh, where this nuance is well explained. You have to subtract one millisecond for the previous value alphabetic sign and also for the brackets. So expected marble for our example will be a bit different. And you can see it on the slide. So we just subtract one millisecond. And now test will pass. Hooray. Uh, you may think uh, it is so tricky to calculate exact delayed values for marble diagrams. And there is a possibility to make it easier. Remember, we provided assertion expression for the scheduler constructor. Uh, this assertion function has two params, expected value uh, and actual value. So we can console log it and check the actual uh, timings which uh, we should uh, provide uh, in the marble diagrams. It, in hard cases, it, it in hard cases it makes debugging our test more uh, easier. Uh, okay, so I will not dig deeper how uh, test run is implemented under the hood. You can check that uh, in the file I provided. Uh, let's sum up. Test scheduler run has many benefits. All tests are visual and we can check every single value. Prod timings can be provided using progressive syntax. 
Async scheduler delegate trick is applied implicitly, and flush method is called in implicit way as well. And it is not tied to any particular testing framework because we provide assertion expression when we create a scheduler instance. And among drawbacks, uh, nuances with timings calculations and some learning curve. So you should know how actually RxJS works and know RxJS quite well. Uh, just to mention here, since we are lack of we have lack of time, uh, test scheduler run method, which we just reviewed, has also uh, some libraries, uh, some wrapper libraries, which allows to uh, reduce boilerplate. One of them is RxJS marbles. Uh, so if Jasmine marbles wraps test scheduler, RxJS marbles wraps test scheduler on method. And uh, I, will, I will pass it so you can one more wrapper library here is Rx Sandbox. Uh, so RxJS Marbles and Rx Sandbox uh, just wrappers around test scheduler run. But as of now, actually test scheduler run is quite uh, is quite is, is enough. You don't even need uh, uh, wrapper libraries to make code shorter because test scheduler run provides all the uh, tools. Uh, in RxJS, actually, uh, for RxJS unit testing. So just uh, this is just for your information, because sometimes in the code basis, I met RxJS marbles, or you can meet uh, Rx sandbox. Now you know what is actually what it uh, what they actually do. They just wrap the scheduler run. Okay, so to continue learning uh, unit testing, you can use these links. Yes, take a look at official RxJS manual. And uh, RxJS GitHub repo has a perfect marble uh, test examples. And just mean marbles and RxJS marbles is another good way to write unit tests with less code. You can take a look at official uh, page, GitHub pages, readme, readme pages as well. Um, just a few words. I want to say special thanks to Nicholas from RxJS core team who helped me a lot in understanding RxJS source code when I prepare this talk and my video course. And also thanks to Kevin Crozer, which uh, allows to use his uh, perfect marble timings nuance uh, tweet. And also I'm grateful to Angular and Depth community, which inspires me a lot and which helped me to create the talk as well. So thank you for your patience. Talk is quite long. Uh, I uh, I hope you I brought something useful to you, and now you understand the unit testing system uh, of RxJS code better. Uh, of course, it is quite quick for such a complicated topic, but you can find this information in my video course, in my free video course. Uh, uh, by the provided link on the slide. And check my articles on Medium and the two platforms to learn more about RxJS and Angular. So thank you one more. And now question time. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Alexander. So RxJS is one of the uh, difficult topic I know. Uh, even I'm trying to learn a lot on RxJS, but I couldn't proceed uh, much on that. And uh, you took us. Uh, I mean, uh, so much effort and putting all this information in one slide. And thank you for uh, sharing this with all with all of us. Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, it was so how how much time it took for us for you to learn RxJS? Oh, uh, I will I will be honest with you. So I worked about uh, one year and a half on a project which uses RxJS, uh, and I thought. I know it <laughs> until I started to create a video course, hands-on RxJS. So I understood that I don't know it quite enough. So it was like two years and plus video course to or even three years to understand it really good. And uh, uh, two, two years, yes. So two years of projects uh, which uses RxJS and uh, what I can advise, uh, so if you learn, uh, you can write articles about it. It helps you to structure information in your head. Uh, uh, actually, I have also 
a few articles on RegJS on my Medium account, so you can check that. I try to make it easier for uh, developers who learn it. So uh, actually, when I started, possibly now this time can be decreased uh, because when I started, uh, there was quite not too much information about RegJS. But now we have a lot of video courses, we have a lot of articles, even free webinars. Uh, so I think uh, one year of learning and one year of advanced, and you are good, you're a master. <laughs> okay. Thank you. And uh, audience, uh, anybody has any question on whatever we discussed so far? I know it's kind of a bit difficult topic, Yes, yes. That's why. Uh, sorry, that's why I provided. Uh, so you can find uh, RxJS unit testing on Udemy, <clears throat> just because it is a difficult topic. Yes, it is free. You can enroll and uh, look through a few times in convenient manner. So, okay. to so do you have uh, do you have that link? Can you share it oh, with me? Yes, yes. Let's. Yeah, I will put it in the YouTube comments so that okay. our audience can take a look. Okay. Whenever okay. they get back. Here. I will put it in the chat here. Can you see that? Okay. Yep, I got it. Okay. I will just put it in the YouTube comments. Uh, Actually, I can provide also my medium with a lot of RegJS articles as well. But in articles, I usually, <clears throat> how to say, uh, observe some advanced stuff. I just added that as a comment in YouTube. So whoever watched this video in future, they, they will also get benefited out of this. Cool, cool. Yep. So anybody else <laughs> uh, have any? Comments or questions on RxJS? Okay, no questions for now. Okay, uh, just reach out to Alexander. He's available on Twitter. Uh, just in case if you have any question on RxJS, and you can also uh, reach out to him on Medium as well. Uh, he's writing articles over there. Uh, there is also a uh, very nice uh, Gitter gr uh, group. Uh, mm -hmm. I will I will try to provide the link. One second. Uh, and the guys really helps uh, and really eager to answer your questions. So one second, I will share so everyone can can ask any questions there. Mm -hmm. uh, and this super helpful. Uh, for uh, as well as for beginners, uh, but for uh, advanced topics as well. OK. I added it in the stream. I mean, your uh, screen. You can share whatever you want. Yeah. OK. So here. Here it is. This is my Twitter and other links as well. Uh, I don't see it. Uh, in the chat, in a private chat. OK. Here. OK, got it, got it, yep. OK, I just added it in the comments. OK. OK. Thanks, Alexander, for taking your time and uh, sharing your knowledge on RxJS with us. Thank you. Thank you for yeah. inviting me. Hope we will have another wonderful session in future, something similar. I hope. I hope also. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, Maniraj. Hi. Hi, Uday. Thank you for uh, sticking with us. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you can uh, uh, give a quick uh, introduction about you, and you can start with your talk. And yeah. uh, I will share your screen as well. Did you share your screen? I will put it on screen. Yeah, I will share it. 
Ya, ayo syahat. I don't. Okay. Yep. Go ahead, uh, Maniraj. Yeah. Hello, all. So and I, I hear some background noise. Can you? Uh, I mean, I don't know who it is. Like, uh, can you put your phone on mute or something? Yeah. Is it better now? Yeah, it's better now. Yeah. Okay. Hello all. Uh, I'm Maniraj. So I'm working as a software engineer at Covent Labs Coimbatore, India. So I'm having totally four years of experience in web development. And uh, I, I'll, I love to spread the uh, knowledge that I have in JavaScript to the community. So that is the uh, short introduction about myself. So uh, let me dive uh, into the topic. So uh, now we are going to see uh, the basics of JavaScript. So the so why JavaScript is included in the Angular meetup? So everyone might have this question. So the reason is uh, if if we are the master of the core and fundamentals of JavaScript, then learning a new framework or learning a new library will not be matter for us. So okay. So because you will only need to learn its syntax and some internal features that we can digest easily, I believe. So agenda of this talk is ESY versus ES6, which is a next generation uh, JavaScript, and the primitive values and reference values, and garbage collection in JavaScript. Yeah. So uh, before going to the topic of ESY versus ES6, let us see what is ES. So ES stands for uh, ECMAScript, and where ECMAScript is a language behind JavaScript, and the ECMAScript is under active development, ES team and different browser teams are working to make new features. As JavaScript is a widespread, people use that many browsers, of course, because process needs to be done with proper care. Okay, so because we can't change the language such that the existing web pages stop working suddenly, so it is only possible to add new features. And we cannot remove any existing features that are available. So that is a short introduction of our ECMAScript. And the now let us look at the evolution of JavaScript over the past years. So major version released in the past is ES5. The version has been uh, released with such a standard. And it is agreed upon by all the browsers. Uh, before ES5, uh, browsers did what they want. And there is not much standardizations followed. So another, so yeah, uh, ESY was first a real big standard after ES3, we can say. And also another kind of major version, which is was finalized in the year 2015, uh, which is also known as uh, ECMAScript 2015 or ES. And it is slowly integrated into browsers. So these are some of the introduction and evolution of JavaScript. Now let us dive into the topic ES5 versus ES6. So ES5 and older versions are supported in, still they are supporting in basically all browsers, including old Internet Explorer, whereas ES5 is only had var keyword, and there is no let or constant keyword before. And it is generally the same syntax as ES6. Whereas on the other hand, if you look at the ES6, which is a new or modern JavaScript, it is supported in modern browsers and it can be transferred to ES5. So uh, as we are using the modern JavaScript, it needs to be transferred to ES5 so that uh, the browsers understand the JavaScript code better. So uh, in ES6, many new features are introduced that will help us write cleaner, better, and faster code. And where ES6 is concerned, still it is under active development. But we can say that ES6 is a big step forward. So I have said that uh, uh, ES, ES6 uh, has uh, shorter, uh, help us to write cleaner, better, and faster code. So what does that really mean? Let us look over some code examples. So here you could be able to see that function uh, add function in ES5 and ES6. 
So normally in ES5, we used to have the function keyword uh, with uh, the function name like add we, uh, that receives two parameters and we use the return keyword to return the value. Whereas in ES6, we can make it very shorter and we can directly use the constant keyword and we can give the name and we can, if there is only one expression to be returned, then there is no need to use the return keyword. So here we can uh, simply return the expression as it is. So also another thing here is suppose if we are having only one parameter, then there is no, of, no need of parentheses over the parameters here. So if, suppose if we are having only X as a parameter, then there is no need of parentheses as well. So in that case, we can still make the code shorter. So now let us also look at the other uh, common feature, the difference between the keywords where let and constant. So normally I think everyone knows it well, but it is just to give the overview and we are not going to dive deeper into it. Okay. So uh, where keyword is used to create a variable and let keyword is also used to create variables. Whereas const, const keyword is used to only create a constant. So where keyword is available uh, since and ever, but whereas the let and const keyword are available since ES6 only. And where keyword uh, has the function and global scope, whereas in the other hand, let and constant has only block scope. So these are some of the uh, introduction to ES5 and the ES6 comparisons and the differences between the var, let, and constant. So now let us move to the next topic that is primitive values and reference values. So let me show the table of. So in JavaScript, there are two categories of types or values. Um, so one is primitive values and another is reference values. Here uh, we are not seeing the different type, different types of data type, but we are seeing the different types of values. So what does this primitive values mean? So primitive values are the values that are st stored in this smaller memory location. So normally string, number, boolean, null, undefined. These are some of the data types that has very small amount of storage. So it's stored in memory normally and stack. So here variable stores value itself. So I hope everyone knows that there are two types of memory available in browser. One is stack and another one is heap. So stack normally stores the stack normally, stack normally stores, stores only the shorter memory. Whereas on the other hand, heap stores the large amount of memory. So in primitive values, copying a variable, uh, it, 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 it directly copies the value. Whereas on the other hand, uh, reference values, which is the all other objects are called as reference values. So before, before we are moving to the reference values, let me give some introduction to the primitive values uh, with live code examples. So here is the code sample that I have. So if we create a variable with value as a string, okay, so as a string, then the value is a primitive value. And if we now create another variable here and assign the value to that variable, we are assigning the name as the value to another user here. So another user still prints the user one. And here we are going to change the value of the name, which is the first variable as user two. Then if we print another user, then it prints the user one itself. So this is what the expected. Whenever we took some value in a variable, then we store it in another variable. It is clear that if we change the original variable, okay, if we change the original variable, the other variable would not change as well. 
so this is called as a primitive value and it copied by its value itself so now we are going to see about reference values i think you might now guess it what would be the reference value so all other objects generally all objects in javascript technically to be correct uh, strings numbers and so on are not objects but dynamically transform to pseudo objects what i mean pseudo objects here is so if i give string dot length then that is called as a pseudo object for example here i am having name is equal to user dot one suppose if i give name dot length then that is called a pseudo object so it is technically created as a pseudo object here so js uh, here js javascript dynamically transform strings numbers to objects if you use dot notation on it other than that it is primitive values only so store it is stored in memory normally in heap that everyone knows and here it it stores only the pointer or reference here it stores only pointer or reference uh, to the location of the memory so here the copying a variable to different uh, variable we, that will copies only the pointer or reference and it won't copy the value itself so let us also dive deeper into the example here so now we are having a now we are having a variable as hobbies and we are having the array into it so it is called sports and then i am copying the uh, sorry i am assigning new variable uh, hobbies to another variable called new hobbies so if you output hobbies then we would get the sports and if you output new hobbies also we will get the sports but here you would think that value is copied but now let's push the new element to the array here we are pushing so here if you see hobbies also has the both both the values and new hobbies also has both the values because it only copy the pointer of the array and it doesn't copy the value of the array so instead the pointer or address alone is copied here so if we change one other array array and the other array also gets changed because there is nothing like one or other array there is exactly one array in memory and both variables holds the same pointer here so what what here what should we need to do so here there is nothing to do with it and it is a default behavior and sometimes we need to copy the data and in that case we need to make sure that if we edit the copy data the original data is not changed so for that we will look at this example here so here we are having the hobbies again as a array then here we are having uh, assigning the hobbies to new hobbies with three dot notation and here this notation is called the brand, is also called as a brand new operator and uh, which is a operator built in javascript and it is called as a spread operator so we can use the spread operator and we can copy the values of hobbies to new hobbies in such case if we print new hobbies we will still have sports and if we again push the values of some other hobbies gardening to the hobbies array then if we print hobbies it will have only sports it will have both the values sports and gardening whereas uh, if we print new hobbies it will print only sports so here the real copy was made so since it is a new array it is a real copy and it is a new variable and data in memory so everything was created as a new one in the browser storage so the same thing will happen for uh, object as well so let us look at the object so here we are having the object person with age 25 and let another person is equal to we are storing the person to another person 
and another person has the age of 25 you can see same thing happening and if i'm uh, adding changing the age of the person to 30 then person uh, is reflected with 30 but another person also reflected with 30 you could be able to see it but if we want to change it to spread the operator again again we can use the spread the operator and we can make the real copy in object as well so here we are having let person is equal to age 25 and we are making the copy of the person to another person and if we print the another person then the age is 25 still and if you are changing the person dot age to 30 person age is 30 it has changed successfully and we can see still we are having the another person age is 25 so this is how we will make the copy of the values to the objects so normally what does this spread the operator do means so it will pull down all the key value pairs and it will store it into the another person variable so it it will make real copy and the new pointer of reference has been stored in the memory location so so these are something about primitive values and reference values then uh, let me move to the uh, last topic which is garbage collection in javascript so for garbage collection in javascript now let's ignore stack memory here because stack is a short living memory and it is cleared automatically because items function calls are part of when they are done but on the other hand heap a long living memory is ma managed in in a way that it doesn't overflow the memory okay the os of our machine allocates only certain amount of memory to chrome and if it is exceeded then it would kill chrome at some point of time but normally that would never happen because chrome has internal memory management which kills your website before it occupies too much of memory so let's see how does chrome manage such memory there is a thing called v8 v 8 garbage collector so i uh, hope everyone knows that uh, chrome's javascript engine name is v8 and i think firefox is it's spider monkey so here in chrome v 8 garbage collector will uh, will collect those uh, unused values uh, let's say every uh, every js engine has one one such garbage collector and other engines built to browser also have garbage collector so what does this garbage collector do means it periodically checks for the heap heap memory for unused objects that is object without reference Re, uh, here references or addresses in the end which are stored in the variables okay therefore garbage collector will remove or clear all unused objects from heap memory let's say for example we are having an object called uh, let person is equal to name uh, username uh, value like that but nowhere it is used in the script let's assume we are declaring a variable but with object as a value but we are nowhere declare we are nowhere calling that uh, object uh, variable uh, in the script so there is no need for us to make any changes clean up work where uh, here so whereas garbage collector does this automatically for us but on the other hand we also need to be sure that the we are aware of the memory leaks so unused objects where still references are hold in the memories so uh, in order to uh, avoid the memory leaks let us clean those uh, variables which we have not used in the scripts so these are some of the things uh, i would like to uh, share with the community in the related with javascript basics and as i am a beginner and uh, this is my first talk and i would like to thank everyone to be here with me so thanks uday for the opportunity thank you No problem, Anirat. So, 
Okay, let me remove your screen. Yep. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, you actually uh, deep dived into JavaScript. Uh, mostly we just go with the uh, uh, syntaxes and other stuff, right? But we don't uh, deep dive into like why this is being used and why this is how it is in JavaScript. And it was very helpful to know. Uh, like one thing, uh, like with single parameter, we don't need to put the uh, parenthesis. Yeah, right? yeah. Those are the features so, that I added in six actually. Yeah. So yeah, I I saw that somewhere here and there, and uh, like I I even used it, but I didn't go much deep into like why it is being used that way in JavaScript. Your explanation was very good, and uh, it doesn't look like uh, it is a first talk for you. Yeah, but actually, this is my first online talk, so okay. Uh, public, yeah. Okay. I would like to thank you Uday, for such a, giving such opportunity. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, audience, uh, do you have any question to Maniraj? So I, I got one question. So if you suggest someone who is zero in JavaScript uh, to pursue their learning in JavaScript, uh, which tutorial you would you would suggest? I would definitely suggest Max Millen's Advanced JavaScript 2020. So that was the okay. course I'm also referring. So he has uh, everything. He covered everything from zero to uh, till advanced level. So he, including testing of JavaScript code, and uh, he has a very good live examples to do work with. So we, there is no uh, uh, practice in uh, just learn, uh, seeing the tutorials, but we have to program along with him so that we can learn better and we can get uh, better in JavaScript. So I would strongly recommend his course. Yeah. OK. Yeah, I even uh, took his Angular course long back. And that's how Angular journey started for me. Like I think like three years back. Yeah. Okay. And uh, we got a question from Rajesh, and uh, I I need to know some. I need to tell something about Rajesh. Rajesh is actually my, uh, uh, what to say, is my student when I was working as a lecturer in college, back in two thousand nine, before joining uh, IT. Uh, thanks, Rajesh, uh, for sticking with us. And he's now a. Uh, uh, I think he's a test lead now, I guess. OK. So here is this question. Uh, is there any limitations on data types for copying or using dot, dot, dot? I think Rajesh shouldn't complete the question or something. No, he's. Uh, I think he's asking about spread operator. So only he's using three dots, I think. Oh, OK. OK. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Rajesh, uh, I, I don't think there is a, there are limitations in using data types. Normally, we use the spread the three dots is called as a spread operator, and normally we use it to copy the uh, values of an uh, variable which is an array or object. So for that purpose only, we are we will use the spread operator, and I don't think there are so much of limitations in it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So any other questions, participants? OK. So I think no more questions. OK. And uh, if you don't mind, can you share me the uh, link for your slide so that I'll I'll put it on Twitter? Yes, so I will share it with you. Yeah, we share it offline or something. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, thanks participants and uh, thanks uh, Alexander and Maniraj. And uh, before we wind up, I have something to say. Uh, we have our next uh, Angular event. Let me share my uh, screen before that. OK. So this is the uh, Meetup event we have uh, coming up in uh, next month. 
So we have uh, Santosh Yadav is going to talk about uh, Angular's dependency. You know about San Santosh Yadav, right? He's a star speaker. Uh, he is talking on uh, Angular in all the meetups that is happening over uh, international forum. Uh, so somehow he's, uh, I mean, somehow I got his uh, time to uh, rope, rope him in, uh, in our next talk. So he's going to share something on Angular dependency with us. I mean, dependency injection with us. And also we have one more talk uh, uh, in the same event from Hari. Hari is from Verizon. So Verizon, uh, I mean, the company came forward and they wanted to have this talk with us. So that's a good thing. So that's a good sign, uh, sign that uh, our meetup is gaining momentum. And uh, we, we are getting a lot of new uh, speakers from across the world as well, right? And even today, we, we got like speakers from Australia and Ukraine. So just in case, if you are interested to talk in uh, the online meetup, uh, just ping me on uh, Twitter. So I'm available on Twitter at, uh, at Ask Udai. OK, this is my uh, handle. You can just reach out to me there. Just follow me there in Twitter. And you can uh, reach out to me there in the uh, message, I mean, Twitter Messenger. So we can uh, talk about what, what we have in our future plans. Okay, so these are the two uh, talks we have in the month of June, and it's it's going to be on June 20. Okay, just uh, RSVP now so that you will not miss the event. I'm just putting this link on YouTube comments as well. Okay. Just in case, uh, if you have time now, just RSVP for the event. And uh, we will also have a fun quiz like last month. Uh, in the next event. So today's event was like a kind of a jam pack. We got back-to-back uh, -back talks. Uh, I kept it such a way uh, since I wanted it to be more informative, even though it was kind of a, a little bit draggy uh, online. If you watch it on YouTube at later point of time, you will you will feel it. Uh, you will feel the actual uh, usage of it, right? You will you will find you will get to know that it is actually benefiting you in some way. Say, for example, if you want to learn RxJS in future, you can just go to this URL, a YouTube URL, and you can drag till like 20 minutes or 30 minutes. From there, you can just watch the RxJS talk given by Alexander. Right? It was a brief talk, but it was very effective. Right? It was very difficult to follow him because he was putting all the uh, important concepts over there. And uh, it was kind of, uh, what to say? little bit difficult at the same time it was kind of a wow feel for me because we need to learn more things in our chase right we just know subscribe and unsubscribe that's not enough so i came to know that in today's event like we have so many things to learn on so that's all i have uh, before we wind up uh, you guys have any question or any comments to share with me So any questions or any comments? How, how was the today's session? So was it helpful or anything if you want to uh, improve? Okay, so Mayraj, you got a got an appreciation from Karigalan. Let's take a look at the comments. Thanks, Harish. Okay, those are my team members who are colleagues working along with me in Covent Labs in Koyamato. So thanks, colleagues, for your appreciation. Wow, that's great. So they are even supportive. Even after, yeah. uh, outside the office, that's great. Yeah, and uh, Arish, yeah, and Arish, thanks for joining and uh, thanks for your feedback. And thanks, Karigalan. And thanks, Rajesh. Okay, so Rajesh has some question. 
uh, I started with Angular from past weekend, started with TypeScript. So he's asking, is it OK I need to stick with JavaScript? I won't say uh, yes, because JavaScript is just the a platform. It, it's just a building block for you to pursue any framework. right? So learn JavaScript first, and then move on to TypeScript, and then uh, go with the Angular learning. Okay, and one more thing, you don't have to learn TypeScript separately as well. So just as and when you start with Angular learning, you will learn, you will come to know uh, TypeScript a lot. But before that, you need to you need to have some basics on uh, JavaScript, like ES6 for sure. So whatever JavaScript we used in our olden days, like during our college days, like in 2009 or 2010, so that was totally different from what we have now in JavaScript. So ECMAScript uh, 2015 or ES6. So just start from there to learn about uh, all the new features we have in JavaScript. OK? So you will apply JavaScript in Angular along with TypeScript. OK? TypeScript will basically be used for uh, setting your uh, data, I mean, setting your variables uh, with the specific data types. On top of that, you will write JavaScript again in Angular. OK? Yes, also, JavaScript is a weakly typed uh, programming language, we can say, so that only TypeScript has been introduced Correct. so that we can declare the types exactly. So IDE itself will throw the error. We, there is no need of spending hours of time in debugging in the browser consoles. So IDE will directly throw the error. So those are Correct. some of the benefits in using TypeScript here. Correct. Correct. Yeah, that's what Rajesh. Are you still have any questions? OK, thank you. And uh, how about others? And thanks, Kari uh, Just keep us uh, uh, supporting and coming up, I mean, coming events. And share this event with your friends. It's an online event, so anyone from any part of the world can join. So don't just hesitate to join with your friends who are from uh, other part of the uh, city or state. OK, it's common for everyone. OK, it's not specific to like one group of people or like one group of uh, area, right? Thanks, Rajesh. Thanks for your feedback. And thanks, everyone, for uh, spending your time and uh, sticking with us. Uh, I think we had a wonderful session today. Uh, we keep uh, moving forward with more sessions, and we will pull like international speakers as well in future. And all these videos will be available in YouTube, just in case if you miss it, like some part of this video or online event. Just go to the uh, YouTube video and uh, take a look. Okay, and you can uh, subscribe to this YouTube channel as well, so that you will not miss any events in future. And Kari Halan asked one question before we leave: Is there any recommended unit testing framework for TypeScript? Okay. Sure. Uh, I don't know as such, but we use uh, Kerma in uh, angular okay uh -huh. i don't know how yeah whether we can use that whether we can use that uh, here uh, anyway but let, let me check on that and get back to you because i i didn't use typescript as such i'm using typescript along with the uh, angular okay but angular comes with like test bits by default which takes care of uh, creating the components and uh, creating the services, objects, all those. OK, thank you so much. And uh, that's all for today. I'm just ending the broadcast. Thanks, Manit. Thanks, Alexander. And thanks, Ben. Uh, ben already left the uh, event because it's already late night for him in Australia. So thanks once again, everyone. Have a great uh, weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.